of you who will remain, <laughs> um, take your Bibles and turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. Now, and when you find that, if you would stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. Now, I know some of you are thinking, Revelation, yay, we're going to figure out the end of the world. We're not going to get to there yet. Um, we're not quite to that point, but Revelation chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. We see, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. You have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this, your word. We ask you to speak to us by it today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I know we get to Revelation and we all start thinking, yay, let's start figuring this out. We've got angels and beasts and, and lampstands and dragons, and, and it's really a lot of fun. But we're not going to go there yet. Um, in fact, we won't go there for a while. Where we're actually headed for the next little while in sermons is we're going to look at the church in Ephesus. And we're going to start here, and then we're going to work our way backwards We'll go from here in Revelation for a couple of weeks, and then we'll go to the book of Ephesians, and then we'll look at a couple of other things that went on so that we can see what there is for us to learn and for us to practice based on what we see there. Now, Ephesus is a city in the Roman Empire, and that's all the history that you get from me today because you know, some of y'all already look way too comfortable you know, it's nice and relaxing out there, and I don't want anybody nodding off yet, but uh, Ephesus is a city in the Roman Empire. It's an important city, and we'll talk about that later. The church is formed uh, there probably about 40 years before the book of Revelation is, is written, give or take. So it's not an old church. Something we need to remember is there are no old churches mentioned in Scripture, except for the idea that the church as the community of God's people you know, is, is eternal. The churches start forming in you know, 30 A.D. and the New Testament is completed by about 95. So there's not a church in the Bible that's not a young church that's having to deal with growing pains and growing difficulties and learning stuff. There's none that have been doing stuff, well, we've always done it that way for 150 years. Any church you find in Scripture that's, you know, if Ephesus, and I think this is actually part of their problem, they start popping up with, well, haven't we always done it this way? And they have to stop and think, wait a minute, no, we haven't. But what I want us to focus on, we're going hit to the, hit the one verse right in the middle of this, about you've left your first love. And I want us to talk about first loves for a minute because, you know, there's a couple things that, that kind of brought it to mind. First of all, the youth went to camp this past week. And so they had the opportunity to go, and I remember camp. Now, most of the times, the summers that I went to camp, I went to Boy Scout camp, so there was no love involved in that. <laughs> there also weren't showers. See, there's a thing that goes together with this. You know, youth camp, it's get up and get in the shower. You know, you go to Boy Scout camp, we're going to swim in the lake later. We'll get clean then. But I do remember, remember one summer and... and uh, we won't mention her name, but uh, I, I do remember one summer at ULR doing a chemistry institute that summer because my children come by their nerdiness, honestly. That was a great two weeks. Me and a buddy of mine went to ULR every day for like eight hours a day to study chemistry in the summertime. We learned to make gunpowder out of pine needles. I don't, there were other things we learned. I also learned from this one cute girl how to balance a Coke can when it was half empty. Uh, but just thinking back to the idea of first loves and just kind of that weird, gushy feeling that you get. 
and that strangeness, that, that bizarreness, and the way that you do interesting and odd things and how sometimes camp draws that out. Where, where you get the, oh, well, we just sat and talked for hours and hours, and when you went off to camp, that happened. And sometimes you went off to camp and realized that what you thought was your first love back at home, something else kind of interrupted that and set you straight. And then there's another thing that's going on, that's going on actually in our family right now, and that is that first love of the time you got to get and sit behind the wheel and turn the key and make it go vroom yourself. Also, on a side note, uh, those of you who are on blood pressure medication in the church, I would like some recommendations as to which brand is best. Um, so I know several of y'all are on it, and so I just need to know. But I, I think back to even that, bizarrely enough, that first car, the 1980 Chevette, with the AM1 speaker radio, the hatchback, that one, at one point, Dad went out and looked underneath it and said, well, you know, it's leaking radiator fluid. And he determined that the leak was in the heater core. And so we went down to the Ace Hardware store and got a coupler, a copper coupler, coupler and cut the hose going into the heater and cut the hose coming out of the heater, jammed those two hoses together and duct taped it, and it stopped leaking. It also stopped warming up. <laughs> but it worked. It still worked. And the freedom and the joy, even though it was not the prettiest thing on the road, not the most powerful thing on the road, but there was a, a, a joy of that first vehicle, that first chance to get to go to run around the corner to the Harvest Foods, and pick up a gallon of milk driving by myself, and then the, you know, then the, the, the Ford that was a little better than that, and then the truck after that, you know, they're just that, that first love, those first cars. Some of y'all remember that. Some of you would still, you would go back if you could, because your first car was a 19, you know, was, was like the Ford Fairlane we saw up at Larry's Pizza last night. You know, it, was a cla it would be classic now. The Chevette, unfortunately, will never be classic. <laughs> In fact, I think at this point, you know, even digging those up, if you were to dig one up, they'd throw you out of the archaeologist, archaeologist union for even mentioning that you found one. But you, know, you would go back to that first love because there's just something about it. You remember it. You remember those moments. There's something special in that first love. And so I want you to think about that. I want you to think back to something like that that has that sense of, oh, this was good. And then we want to take a look at this because John challenges and really Jesus challenges the church at Ephesus that they needed to remember their first love. Now some first loves, they come and they go. And you replace them with something better. Some first loves, though, you still hold on to. I remember, gosh, it's been probably, I guess it was somewhere in the mid-80s, so probably 30 years ago. First opportunity to go to a Major League Baseball game. And we went to Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, which has since been replaced with a parking lot. Replaced by another stadium. It's about to be replaced by another stadium. And the Braves aren't any better this year than I think they were 30 years ago when we went to see them. And yet somehow, if you ask me about baseball teams, that's my first love. Don't know why. Just is. I guess because back then, in the rare occasion, you know, in the occasions that we did have cable, you could get WTBS, and since they didn't have, they didn't have all the reruns of Seinfeld and Law and Order to run, then they had to actually show new content, which was Atlanta Braves baseball games. It was worth worth watching. And so we hold on to those; those form our lives. 
But when God speaks to the church at Ephesus here, He's not really talking about sports, and He's not talking about He's not even talking about that first puppy love crush that you had. He's not talking about He's not talking to the church at Ephesus about oh, you know, their first chariots. Who go back and remember? Yeah, I had the fancy two wheel model. How many horsepower? Two. One, two, three. He's talking about something even more important, and that is, what was their first love together as a church? What was the first and most important thing that they wanted to hold on to as a people? And we'll go through some of the praise that he has for the church in another sermon. But we want to think about what maybe they forgot what maybe they had set aside. Because they had set aside what they had valued the greatest. And they had substituted for it, making sure they went through the motions. It talks about that they, you know, that they were persevering and fighting and making sure that they kept the evil people out of the church, which was a good thing. They didn't let false teachers come in. That was a good thing. And they were doing all these good things. But what they had was a habit instead of a heart. They had a habit of holiness, but they didn't have a heart for God. They had a habit of walking in a certain way, but they didn't have a heart that actually felt and obeyed out of a love that was within them. They had lost their first love. Some of y'all know what this is. You wake up in the morning, you look across the room, you see your sister that you share a bedroom with, you say, oh yeah, I can't kill that person today. It's my sister. Maybe you're adults. She just shows up at your house. She just shows up and you say, eh, you know, I can't smack her. I might want to, but I can't. It's my child. I can't hurt them, but I, some days I just really want to. And so you follow the rules. But it's not out of a heart of love. It's just out of the fact that, you know, you get in trouble. If I punch my sister in the nose, my dad will hurt me. I don't know if that's true in my case. We may find out at lunch. <laughs> but there are just certain things where we behave a certain way out of a heart, out of, out of a habit, but not out of a heart. And I think that's where the church at Ephesus had gotten to. And I think sometimes that's the way we have gotten to as a church as well. We get up in the morning and we come to church which is good. Please don't ever hear me say, just skip it and stay home. I like it when you're here. We miss you when you're gone. I know we need to tell that to the people that aren't here, because y'all know that, because you're actually here, but there are folks, we miss you when you're gone. Your Sunday school class misses you when you're not there. Sunday school classes, let's make sure we're doing a good job of letting people know that. Because y'all are more aware than I am of who's here and who's not here. Reach out. Make contact. Let it be known. But we get up. We come. We go home. We say, okay, I filled in that checkbox for the week. Stop and think about why you ever started coming here in the first place. Some of you, the answer is, well, because daddy drug me to church when I was a kid. That's the church daddy went to. That's the church grandma went to. And so that's why I come to church here. Let me challenge you to stop and think about whether or not you can develop a love for being here. Remember that first love that brought you to this place. Even more than that, think about that time that you first admitted your need for a Savior. Think about your love for Jesus and where that started from. Because so many of us, we get wrapped up in the fact that, well, there's this huge list of rules to follow. I mean, we've got a lot of stuff we're supposed to do. Look at this. I mean, i got this and this and this. got all these things to do. There's all this stuff that needs doing. I don't have time to stop and contemplate what this is supposed to be in my heart. And yet... That's where we're supposed to begin. Everything that we do ought to be motivated by the love that we have for Jesus. And that love comes from Him. You go back to to 1 John and you see we love because He first loved us. 
Our love for Him and our response to Him is based on what He's already done and what He's already given. Because, you see, the greatest love that we should ever know is the fact that Jesus died for us. Greater love has no man than this, that He lays down His life for His friends. This is something that is worth remembering every day as we go through life. That the greatest love that we know and you see, that's another way that the Bible uses the term for first. Sometimes it's the first in order, and sometimes it's the best. This is how you can get preachers arguing in a huge circle because you get to talk, to them, talk to them about what a first fruits offering should be. Because they say, well, it should be the first, the first that comes in. And then you go, no, it's the best that comes in. And they'll just argue each other blue in the face. It's a great way to get away and get in line at the potluck first. Senior adults, when y'all go to uh, Senior Adult Focus uh, at the end of the month, distract the preacher so that you can get to the food first by getting them to answer that, okay? That's the best way to do it. Get them to argue about those things. Our first love is also our greatest love, our best love. And the best love that we have is the love that Jesus showed for us and the love that we show from Him to others. And we show that not simply by walking around with our noses up about how great and amazing that we are. But we show it even by some of the things that we sang about, that we talked about, the need to make sure that there is righteousness in our lives and liberty for all. That as we look at the world around us and we see people struggling it is not enough that we should go around to try to make them like us. It is that we make people seek the, the good of others, that they can freely follow Christ. We talk about the faith of our fathers in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. That's not just words in a song. That's words that reflect what tens of millions of your fellow believers actually encounter around the world. And that we have a liberty that protects us from, which is a glorious thing. Those are words, and, and uh, one of my good friends is Dr. Emil Turner. He's a preacher. He, right now he's preaching over at First Southern in Bryant, but every day he'll post, he's got, from where he reads a lot of history, he's got the list of those who have died for their faith in Christ. And every day there's another story. Every day of the year, there are those who were killed simply for holding high the name of Jesus. Every day. So what do we do with that? First, we look at our own lives. Where do you stand? What is your love for God and what does it show? Is it even there? Most of us would say, well, yeah, of course it is. Why else am I in church? Lots of reasons people go to church. Some people go to church because mama made them. Some people go to church because it's the only place in town with electric lights. Well, we don't really have that problem anymore. But you know, that used to be one of the things that was the case. Church had electric lights. Nothing else in town did. That's why they had church on Sunday night. That's how you got everybody to come. Some people go to church because like the movie theater. We've got the air conditioner down. It's mostly cool. Actually, most movie theaters are a whole lot more comfortable than, than, than the church building is. Some people come so they can be seen. So everybody knows I was in church. Some people come because if you came to church today and you take your bulletin and go grocery shopping this afternoon, you get 5% off at the Harvest Foods. You say, surely nobody comes to church just to get 5% off on their groceries. You don't know how much it costs to feed their family. They might. Some people eat. Some of y'all that got kids to feed, you, you probably ought to at least think about it. If you're not here starting off out of your love for Jesus, then that could be a problem. And it's easy for us to fall in that habit. I'm here because it's my habit to be here. Some of y'all look at me and say, you're probably here because it's your job to be here. You realize that's a spiritual struggle that your pastor and some of your other folks here that, that do things that make Sunday morning service go 
have to fight with? Your sound guys have to fight with that to make sure that they're here out of love for Christ and not just out of, somebody got to run the sound system. Choir members, music leaders, piano players, Sunday school teachers, nursery workers. It's a challenge that we have to meet to make sure we show up every Sunday out of a love for Christ and a love for the church. So we start from that. What is our love for God? Is it there? What would we and wouldn't we do? See, the church at Ephesus was at the point that they would run out the bad people, but they weren't really engaged. They were just kind of drifting through. So what is our first love? Think about it. When you first fall in love with something, you do just about anything. If I came across a, the kind of car I'm in love with, I'd try to figure out all sorts of ways. I'd, you know, I don't know how I'd manage to trade the van for it, but I'd find a way. Doubled the van's value this week. I filled it up. <laughs> when you first fell in love, some of you think back to the first time you fell in love with, you know, fell in love with your husband, with your wife. Think of what you did for that what you would still do. Many of you say, well, you know, I've kind of settled down since then. I've settled down. I have realized that I need sleep. We can't stay up till 3 in the morning and talk and turn around and be at work at 7 the next day. We used to do that. When we first fell, when we first fell in love, she used to ride with me at work. I was not in a happy line of business. But here we are 18 years later, you know, and when we first started off, she was ride, ride with me in a hearse to go places. What would you do? And yet now we say, well, I'm more mature than that. First come to Christ, we say, oh, I'd do anything. I'd go anywhere, tell anybody. But since then, many of us have become more mature than that. Well, I don't really want to say good things about our church and encourage people to come because if they came, they might discover that, you know, the church has people in it that aren't perfect. Folks, I'd like to give you just a basic understanding of church. You will not find this side of eternity a church that has no sinful people in it. You will find a church building that has no sinful people in it. A friend of mine posted a picture of one this week on AbandonArkansas.com. It's got a tree growing straight up through the middle of it because it's empty. That's the only way to find a church without hypocrites and sinful people in it. You come up here on Tuesday. Well, Tuesday will be uh, Brother James's service, so we'll leave Tuesday alone. You come up here on Thursday, there will be sinful people in this church. Come up here Wednesday afternoon, there will be sinful people in this church. There won't be that many of us here, but I guarantee you we're still sinful people trying to be in, in need of a Savior. Every day. You say, oh, I don't want to tell people about Jesus. They might get their feelings hurt. You know, there's a time that we didn't care how people's feelings felt. Because we realized something. The love of God for them was as great as His love for us. And we want to tell them about him. But now we've gotten more mature than that. There was a time that we actually believed that God would work in people's lives, that God would heal, that God would save, that God would change people. Because our first love was so fixed on the power of God that we didn't think anything would stand in its way. And somehow we've set that aside as if maybe we've grown up past it. There are things that we grown up we grow up past. I've grown up past being infatuated with an FM radio radio that we put in the dash that we got at Walmart for thirty bucks. Had two speakers that we put in the uh, Chevette when I was a kid. I've grown up past the crush I had on a cute little third grade girl named Amy in Louisiana. I don't even remember what she looked like now. She probably doesn't look anything like that anyway. That was a long time ago. There are things we grow up past. 
But there are other things that are greater than that that we should never set aside. We should never set aside our willingness to go anywhere, to do anything, to honor God in whatever is set before us. And so I challenge you today, turn back to what your first love for God was. It's what we desperately need as people. It's what we need as a church. And if you take the time this week to crack open maybe a little bit about the history of how we started off as a nation and what our first love was, and that was liberty to allow people to serve God as they felt led by Him and convicted by His Word. Liberty that believed that all people were created equal. And it took a little while to get, the, get that to people. We know that. Realize that that's one of the things that we need to recapture as a people and as a nation is what our first love was. So let's come back to that today. Maybe you need to come, back, come to that for the first time, and if so, I'll be glad to talk with you about that and look at it with God, from God's Word with you. Because we need that first love. And we need to remember what we had. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to be here. We ask you, Lord, to draw us near to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.